I now have the great pleasure of presenting Dr. Diana Greenwald, Assistant Curator of the Collection at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, presenting Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? Artistic Labor and Time Constraints in 19th Century America. Welcome. Thank you so much. Hi there, and thanks for having me. Thanks to QSide. Um, so I will go ahead and do the famous awkward uh, screen share. Do this. And let me just get into presentation mode. Is everyone seeing my slides? Hopefully they, you are. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, so today I'm gonna talk to you about why have there been no great women artists, artistic labor and time constraint in 19th century America. But before we get there, I wanna talk a little bit about the history of the use of quantitative analysis in art history. So, I know we're talking on Zoom and we're in a very computerized age, so you're probably wondering why I'm starting with an IBM punch card. But this is part of a great story about kind of quantitative pioneers in the field of art history and also pushback that they've received and how much work we have to do. So I'm putting up this punch card because in the 1960s, if you can believe it, there was an art historian at Yale. His name was Jules Prown. Um, and he was working on a really big study of an artist named John Singleton Copley. I'll show you his work in a minute. And he decided to do statistical analysis using IBM punch cards and the computer lab at his university to see relationships between social and economic backgrounds of portrait subjects and their preferences in portraiture. So some of these portraits, this is one of my favorites because it's just so wonderfully weird were things like this little kid holding a squirrel. Um, but across this artist's entire work in 18th century America and Britain, Brown was actually able to see patterns between if someone was a merchant or if they had, were of a certain religion and what they chose to purchase um, from this painter. So he gets on stage, he puts up an image of his IBM punch card, describes his conclusions, and he actually was booed. Um, he was, as he put it, berated in the aisles for daring to quantify art history. And he wrote an essay about the experience. And he said that based on the reception, or the very cold reception that his research had gotten, he figured that art historians would embrace computers and data in order to find things, find information about paintings and you know, certain artists, but they would resist its more complex statistical uses. And I would say in general, he's been right. Um, since the 60s, there hasn't been a ton of evolution on this front. Uh, and that's where I've tried to come in. So I'll give you a little bit of a guide of where we're going. Um, I'm trained as both an art historian and an economic historian. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about how we can use concepts from economic history as a guide for data-driven histories of art. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the historical data of the art world. Um, so what data is even out there? And then we'll discuss what we can learn from a sort of zoomed out macroscopic data driven view. And that's where really these questions about women artists come in. And then I'll have some final thoughts. So economic history is a guide for data driven histories of art. Here's another slide and you're like, I signed up for the art section. Why is she showing me a graph of changes in heights over time? But I promise you there's a point. Um, when I was trained as an economic historian, something that we learned about was that scholars use historical heights as a way to study human health through time. So heights like these. And that's interesting, you know, sort of from a scholarly perspective. But what really struck me when I was learning about this was actually a story. And it was a story about how a group of scholars were working on height records that were drawn from military kind of enlistments and drafts. Um, and they realized sort of midway through working with these records that these armies actually had height minimums. So what that meant is that these historical records that they thought were capturing an entire population's height and therefore their health, uh, in fact, was limited 
this it was a biased sample that was only capturing the tallest people, the ones who had surpassed the height minimum. And so their conclusions were incorrect because of this phenomenon that economists and you know data scientists, lots of quantitative people are familiar with, which is sampling bias. Because the historical record was biased, the historical conclusions that we were drawing based on that particular sample were perhaps not valid or were invalid. Now, in art history, the concept of sampling bias is much more difficult and thorny to sort out. But if we think of the sample of historical art that we study as a set art historical canon, the kind of great masterpieces that get all the attention in the museums and in the textbooks, that would be you know, our sample. The problem is we don't really know in which ways it's biased. We don't have that sort of aha moment of realizing there was a height minimum. We don't have population level information about all the art created in a certain time period and place to help us understand the constraints of the sample we study. Or I should say, at least we thought we didn't. So that's where we get to the historical data of the art world. And as I said, I'm also trained as an art historian. So I'm, and I'm a curator now. Um, and so I'm very sensitive to the fact that art historians love creating lists of things. And so this is an example of one of these many lists of things. And it turns out that there's a whole cache of art historical data out there that's largely based on exhibitions that happened in the 19th century. So if you had a, you know, what then was a contemporary show of artists showing their work in the 19th century, there would be like a little printout that would accompany that show that would list everything that was included. And these kind of little brochures then got all lumped together in a series of publications that actually give you really comprehensive lists of all these works that were shown in the 19th century, many of which have actually since disappeared. So we're getting at least a glimpse of the entire landscape of what was shown in the 19th century. And it's a real time snapshot. It's a list from that time. And it turns out we can turn this into data. Obligatory, uh, here's the obligatory spreadsheet to show all the work it takes to transcribe it. But we do have huge data sets, it turns out, of all these works that were shown in the 19th century. Now there's another source of data that art historians tend to underestimate that helps us actually understand the sample. So if this list is sort of the population of 19th century works of art, we can also get at that selective sample and that's by using museum data. And so this is an example of just kind of a standard object page that you would see on any online museum collection. But the secret here is that there's actually a back end. It's called TMS, or often it's TMS. Other, other, some museums use other systems. But in this back end is a wealth of information. And in this case, it can be exported to a spreadsheet, which is a lot easier than transcription. And so we can compare population to sample. So what can we learn once we have all this data? And now there's some kind of low hanging fun historical fruit. I'll start with one graph, which is actually about 19th century France, and then we'll get into our prime case study about women artists. But this is an example of basically from a, from a, French, a major French exhibition called the Paris Salon. And what you're looking at here is a graph that pretty much shows you the French Revolution in real time. This, this, and, oop, this in light blue is actually depictions of the kings of France. So Louis the 14th, 15th, 16th, there's the revolution. Louis the 16th first loses his throne and then his head and he and his family members completely disappear from the walls of this contemporary um, art exhibition. This is the Napoleon Bonaparte shows up. He's shown a lot more. This huge spike is actually a desperate attempt to restore the French monarchy. It doesn't work out. They disappear from the, from the art world again. And we have some more Bonapartes. So this is sort of a fun one because we can see politics and art interacting in real time. But what I'm much more interested in 
is how we can use data to understand sort of the inequities of the artistic sample that we study. So this fantastic work um, is by the Gorilla Girls. I think some of you may have seen this before. Um, they, are a, they are a feminist artist collective that was founded in the 80s. And they created this poster, which you know asks um, quite provocatively, do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? And they cite this statistic that only 5% of the artists in the modern art sections are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. So a brief aside, I was actually kind of working on an exhibition that included some Guerrilla Girls works, and I saw this stat, and of course, as both an economic and an art historian, I loved the statistic, and I was sort of intrigued by it. I was like, how can I see if this statistic, this 5% number, is borne out more generally. And at the same time, coincidentally, I was also studying a work that had come to the National Gallery of Art, where I used to work, um, that was a collection, part of a collection, this is one of them, Fidelia Bridges, um, this beautiful still life, a collection of 19th century American still life. And I noticed, just anecdotally, that in this collection of still life painting, there seemed to be far more women artists represented um, than we had in the collection in general. So I was sort of curious. I was thinking, well, is it that women have to paint fruit and flowers to get into the National Gallery of Art? Or are they just painting more still life in the 19th century? And that's why they're better represented in this kind of niche collection of still life painting. And then I realized I didn't have to wonder, I actually had the data. So I had data from the National Academy of Design. You actually saw a list of it earlier, which was a major art school and exhibition venue um, in the 19th century United States. It was in New York. And so the first thing I did was try to track how many women artists were exhibiting at the National Academy of Design regularly. And I want to take a brief aside to note how I was able to kind of measure the number of women artists. Of course, you know, women and gender, gender is a complicated uh, identifier and topic. And I had to make some calls which are not necessarily in line with how we understand gender in the 21st century. But basically, I used a program to read the first names or honorifics, sort of Miss, Mrs. listed with artists in the catalogs that would allow me to assign whether or not an artist was a woman. And I'm happy to talk in the Q&A a little bit about categorization and gender and how complex that is, but I just wanted to call that out. Now, the first thing I want you to think about is that actually women artists are really active in the 19th century, much more so than I expected. You know, they're routinely showing 15 to 20% of works after the Civil War, so after about 1860. And I knew that this was a higher number than I had seen sort of generally in many collections of 19th century American art. It's certainly higher than the 5% number the Guerrilla Girls see. But I wanted to understand exactly what's going on in this kind of broad participation. And so something that, um, that struck me, and again, because I was working on this collection of still life, is I realized that the vast majority or a lot of the still life paintings that were being shown at the National Academy were actually by women artists. And the graph is a little chaotic in this first half, in part because I sort of had a small denominator issue. But what you realize is that still lives are identifiably by male men, um, artists, uh, about 10% of the time. And women are producing sort of between 30 and 40% of still lifes. And there's a huge number of sort of unidentified uh, still life makers in part because they're shown as anonymous or an amateur. And as we know from qualitative research, whenever someone is anonymous or an amateur, actually it's usually a woman artist or they're showing under initials in order to not be specifically identified with their gender and sort of pigeonholed. So we have evidence that in the 19th century, 
women are really active in this genre of still life. Now you'll realize if you go to any kind of major museum, and this is a view of the American wing, which holds the 19th century American holdings of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, there's not a heck of a lot of still life that makes it onto the walls of these major collections. Um, people tend to go more for things like the heroic Washington crossing the Delaware. And it turns out we can bear this out quantitatively. So this is using um, collections data from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I want you to pay attention to a couple of things. First, there are about 6,000 works in this collection. About 6.3% of them are by women artists, although we have about 8% where no gender is assigned. And then if you look at still life painting, that number explodes to 23, almost 24%. So this is in line with the 19th century production, but I want you to look at the N number. Here, N equals 105, right? So it means there are only 105 still life paintings out of 6,000 works in this collection. So we're seeing that the genre where women are most active is also under collected by major museums. Now, why are women so active in still life? We don't just want to stop with this observation. We really want to think this through. And one answer um, is that usually people rely on, and it's not false, is that the 19th century was pretty sexist. <laughs> Women were excluded from a lot of arts education, including life drawing classes. Although you're seeing here, this is a women's life drawing class from 1879, so not completely excluded. So the general explanation has been it was socially acceptable for women to paint fruit and flowers, and therefore that's what they did. Now there's some truth to this, but it felt a little bit lazy to me and also actually not in line with it turns out what was quite good access to arts education for, for American women, at least compared to the European counterparts at the time. And so I kind of turned to my economic history side and I started thinking about the work of a labor economist actually up here in Boston at Harvard named Claudia Golden. Um, and she's done some wonderful work about women in the workforce and which in which jobs women tend to thrive or not. And I'll just briefly summarize what she's come up with is that there are some commonalities across jobs where women tend not to do as well and these are, if we sort of think about in the current day, sort of banking or being lawyers, some of these issues have to do with very intensive time demands, but it's not just about ha having to be at work all the time, it's having to be at work on someone else's schedule. So on a client schedule, they call you late, they say, I need this by 2 a.m. tonight, too bad, you have to do it. Um, and so it turns out this structure of time intensive work that is on a client facing schedule is particularly incompatible with the domestic responsibilities that we know, unfortunately, women continue to be tasked with and bear often more than their partners, certainly in a heterosexual setting, but we know that there are also inequities in all sorts of couples around domestic labor. And so using this point of view, I sort of realized, or I should back up, Golden then shows, in contrast, jobs where women do really well can have huge time demands, but they tend to be more like shift work. So you can actually think about emergency medicine, which is an increasingly female discipline. Um, and that's because when you're an ER doctor, when you're on, you're on, you work long hours, but when you're at the hospital, you're at the hospital. And when you leave, you leave and you don't have follow-up or all of this client-facing stuff and networking, et cetera. And it turns out that sort of I'm working when I'm working and I'm not when I'm not structure tends to lead to more gender equality in different fields. And so it turns out there are some analogies to this in the art world and genres. So think about still life, or rather, let's think about if you were a portrait painter. If you're a portrait painter, you have to paint a rich person on someone else's schedule, that person's schedule. They tell you when they want you there, you adjust to them. It's client facing. It takes a lot of kind of marketing and networking to do. 
It's actually kind of the art world equivalent of being a banker. Still life, in contrast, is something that you can set up and it won't move. It doesn't tell you what time it's available. It's not a sort of landscape survey party that only leaves once every five years. And if you go, you go. And if you don't, you miss it. Um, you can set it up and it's up to the artist to come and go as, he, as they please to paint the subject. It's a lot more like shift work. And it turns out, we know from the archival record, which I won't dive into here, that it's a lot more compatible with the domestic demands that a lot of women artists are balancing in the 19th century along with their careers. So there's a structural reason that women may be more active in this genre. And just to finish up, it turns out it's not just genres, but it's also media. So what you're looking at here, again, is museum data. We're looking at works by, by male artists. And this is sort of the type of object. And the most common type of object in the Met for men is, is drawings and pastels, or I should say in the Met's American wing, followed by oil paintings, watercolors, and then sculpture. When we do this same breakdown by medium for women artists, Miniatures, which are kind of these light sensitive small paintings, um, are the most common, followed by drawings and pastels, watercolors, and finally oil on canvas. And what I want to point out here is that these first three objects are things that can't be on view all the time. They're light sensitive. They're faster media, they're quicker, they're more compatible with the time constraint schedule, but they're also the media that don't make it to the walls of these major museums. So we're seeing yet another kind of structural source of discrimination. I think Isabel's appeared, so I think I'm out of time, <laughs> but I will leave it there. Well, thank you so much for this amazing talk. We do have a few questions from the audience yeah. um, in our final moments. Um, I was wondering if you could, one of the questions is if you could expand a bit more on how quantitative methods could account for a more expansive acknowledgement of gender among artists, both historically and in present day. Oh, sorry. Wait, Isabel, can you say that one more time? I, I, I missed that. Just no one worries. More time. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the questions is how do you think quantitative methods could account for a more expansive acknowledgement of gender among artists, both historically and present day, and how we think about female artists? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first thing that we can do and from the past and to the present um, is that it helps us realize that there are women participating, there are female artists participating in the art world at a much greater rate than we thought, right? So it corrects this, this false sense that um, they aren't present and that's why they're not in museums. Actually, the disconnect is later. Um, and I think we can also use that as a guide for what is um, seeing women's participation in art schools, we know they graduate more frequently in galleries, and then comparing that even in contemporary collecting to museums and see if it really is representative of the population or if some of this gatekeeping in institutions is biased and we can actually gauge that. That's really interesting. Um, I'm really curious to, you know, to read about more of your work and to also see how um, all of this expands in like the greater knowledge. Um, another question we have is how has any of this, if at all, changed from um, the pandemic due to being at home? Um, and how has that affected both art and how we categorize art and the production of it? Yeah, um, that's a really great question. So I think the first thing is a question actually, I think about categorization. Um, because museum workers, a lot of us have been at home um, for a long time at this point, or I'm actually in the office today, I get to come in very rarely. Um, we've been doing a lot of cataloging work. And so that has really helped us think about making sure all our things are digitized, all of our objects, but also how we categorize that work and how we're cataloging to measure questions of diversity. Um, so I think the pandemic has actually accelerated those discussions because cataloging and cleaning up databases is something that we can do from home. Well, Dr. Grunewald, thank you so much for this thought-provoking talk and thank you to our participants for sending in some questions. As a reminder, we are hosting